Well, welcome back to the Indie Vets Happy Hour. I am your host, Dr. Andrew Heller, DVM, with my co-host, Dr. Marissa Brunetti. VMD. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> and we are actually here in episode 36, finalizing, almost finalizing our Optho series with Dr. Casey Robinson, DVM. Thank you. My side. Um, and <laughs> My it side. Is, it is a hot summer today for everybody, right? 100 degrees here in Philly. What about you, Casey? Uh, 90 when like 800% humidity. Casey worked in an animal hospital without air conditioning yesterday. Oof, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I was three pounds lighter when I got out of there. <laughs> it's yeah. the new diet. It's like that. that <laughs> the new workout. Work Just work without any air conditioning. So uh, speaking of hot summer, for those of you who haven't checked it out, last summer, Marissa and I did a whole series on Hot Pet Summer, it's a hot pet. Summer, so you know she got <laughs> which was a lot of fun. So check out those episodes. I, it's probably like episode 15 or something like that. We're up to episode 36. Awesome. And um, hopefully so far, everybody's finding these optho discussions very eye-opening. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I just threw up in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of in my mouth. What? What are we what are we drinking? Whoa, What's whoa. everybody drinking? <laughs> <laughs> so I am drinking, it's called Rennie Double IPA from Pigeon Hill Brewing Company in Muskegon, Michigan. Trying to keep it local. That's excellent. What about you, Marissa? Anything going on today? <laughs> well, in my mouth is nothing because I'm gonna do a <laughs> Peloton boot camp right after this simultaneously with Andrew Heller, although he'll be running and I'll be biking. That's right. So I'm holding off on my beer until after, but I will just tell you I will be having on this hot pet summer day, <laughs> I'll be having a Corona with lime. I know it's not local. I know it's mass produced, but when you're this hot, <laughs> it hits the spot. It hits. It hits. All right. Well, let's let's get back into things. So Casey, just to give everybody a, uh, a little back history on the, uh, the previous Optho series, we've talked about glaucoma. We've talked about KCS, Casey, yes. Uh, and we talked about cat's eyes. So today, what are we talking about? Today, we are talking about the cornea, which is kind of an interesting uh, order because the cornea is probably the most common uh, part of the eye that we see as general practitioners or disease processes of the cornea. So I'm really excited to talk about it. You know, normally these are obviously for general practitioners, pretty pretty practical in nature. But I think I always say pet owners this is really important as well. And I think especially the cornea, because that's what they're seeing the most. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe if you could give like a very high level, non doctory speak about what the cornea does and is. You can think of the cornea as just the, the window to the eye, as it's the clear part. There are no vessels, but it gets its nutrition, nutrients from the aqueous. It's composed of four layers. There's the epithelium, which is the outside layer, that's kind of going to be one of the more relevant structures that we'll talk about today. There's the stroma, which is going to be the, the middle cushiony layer. That's going to be com comprise most of the cornea. Um, that's made of collagen, which again will become pertinent later. Then there's decimase membrane. That's going to be the membrane of the endothelial layer of the cornea. That endothelial layer is going to be the fourth layer, and that's the innermost layer. That one's really, really important because what that does is keeps your cornea clear. It pumps out water from the stroma. So when you have endothelial dysfunction, that's one of the reasons you'll get that blue cloudy eye because that endothelium isn't working. But that's kind of the, the basic anatomy of the cornea. So one of the things we'll talk about that we use diagnostically in the cornea a lot, which pet owners may see us do, right, is the fluorescein stain. So like I call it the creepy yellow alien eye stain, right? Mm -hmm. So tell, tell pet owners why we do that and what we're looking for. So when we do the fluorescein dye test in the clinic, we are looking for corneal ulceration. We are looking to see if the epithelium and its associated membrane has been ruptured or it hasn't been damaged. In a normal eye, we could stain all of our eyes right now, put a drop of the fluorescein dye, rinse it out, and you won't see any dye. It will be clear. It does not adhere to normal healthy epithelium. When you have that breach and it goes through the basement membrane, you get that stain pickup, that adhering of the green dye. You'll look with a cobalt blue. Usually you'll see 
a different colored light that we'll use to look at the dye, uh, cobalt blue, and it will just glow green. So that's going to be diagnostic for a corneal, corneal ulcer. Yeah, and I always explain it to, to my clients, like, it's like a windshield on a car, right? If you have a if you have a normal windshield, water just goes right off it, right? It could just be wiped away. But if there's a chip, you're going to see like dirt could get in it, things like that. And it's not clear anymore. That's a really good analogy. I like it. I'm stealing it. So, yeah. So I think, why don't we talk a little bit about the physiology of the cornea? Yeah. So looking at the physiology of the cornea, we can talk about a healthy cornea, but I don't think that's going to be completely relevant for the scope of this podcast. So I'm going to really concentrate on the physiology of healing. So all the different layers have to heal when damaged, right? So the epithelium, when damaged, is going to undergo something called epithelial sliding. And basically it will go re-epithelialize. That should happen in the normal cornea without any complications within four to seven days. Now, is it a completely normal cornea at day seven? No. Attachments from the cornea to the underlying stroma, um, those don't happen by day seven. Those still have to, and I believe they completely form between 45 and 48 days, um, their hemidesmosome attachments. So by day 48, you should have a pretty normal cornea. But for all intents and purposes, from a healing standpoint, the epithelium is healed and the dog doesn't know it has a problem or cat by day seven. Um, the stroma, it's going to be replaced by basically fibrovascular ingrowth. In the uncomplicated stromal injury, it's going to be avascular. But when it gets really nasty, like infected or really destructive lesions, you're going to need vessels. You're going to need vascularization. Um, the endothelium, you don't see a ton of damage to that as far as like traumatic, but it does happen with penetrating injuries. You're going to see retraction of the endothelium, kind of exposing the inner inside of that stroma those endothelial cells will slide in to cover that defect. It might not completely cover the area in really extensive lesions, so you can have some persistent areas of kind of like a little blue edematous area. My undergrad research, which I still attribute to getting me in veterinary school, was looking at factors associated with healing of Decimase membrane of the corneal epithelium in rats after freeze injuries. Very Whoa. specific. Freeze injuries? <laughs> Yeah, we would freeze the cornea of euthanized rats oh. with a, you just would fill this little device with like liquid ice, like nitrogen, and you'd freeze it and then you culture it and you see how the cell, it was, it was cool, um, not really clinically relevant, we can cut this, but. Um, I don't know, I think this is great. <laughs> yeah, we can keep it. It's just like we a little it. window into your undergrad soul. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll never, I'll, that'll, it'll always be there. Um, one thing, and this, this might be misplaced, but I did, when we talk about healing, you know, from the clinical side, we all know don't put steroids on ulcerated eyes. But when you actually ask people why, it's honestly, it, it you, you don't always get a clear cut answer. So I want to clear that up today. Why do we not put steroids on ulcerated eyes? Number one, it inhibits epithelial regeneration. Number two, it inhibits corneal infiltration with inflammatory cells, and I believe it's also anti-angiotic, so you're not going to get that vascular ingrowth that you want in an ulcer, in really severe ulcers. Inhibits fibroblastic activity and endothelial regeneration, lessens the strength of the wound. Very notably, it potentiates collagenase activity, which can lead to keratomalacia or a melting corneal ulcer. To piggyback on that, you do, you're immunosuppressing the area, so you do have a risk of infection. Basically, if you look for a list of when am I okay to use a steroid, if you have controlled infection, if you have a negative fluorescein dye test, so epithelial covering, there's a little more that goes into that, but if you have a negative fluorescein, you're, you should be okay. If you have a nice smooth cornea, I should say, and that's completely covered, you can use a steroid. Uncompromised integrity of the cornea, and if the corneal disease is not caused by feline herpes or other infectious agents, we're not going to deal with a ton of infectious etiologic agents in small animal practice, but feline herpes is one of them. And canine herpes actually does cause ulcers in dogs, or I should say erosions. I think that's what the study said. Hmm. But those are, those are the times when you have a green light to use a steroid. That's a great review. And you're right. You're basically just said like no steroids in ulcerated corneas, but like you don't know why. And you assume it's because of the infection, but there's lots of other reasons. So what I, what I didn't realize is angi you said angiolytic. 
I wonder if that's why steroids are also used in um, neoplasia. Same, same with NSAIDs. Those, those are anti-angiotic too, or angiolytic for sure. I think yeah, that's, that's a good point. So before you put any steroid on the cornea, fluorescein dye test, at least. No question. Any, any, even if I do a refill, say right. this dog is chronically on steroids, which I have problems with, but it happens. They need it um, for like a pandas dog or something like that. Even for a recheck, I don't feel comfortable even refilling a, medica- a topical steroid without testing the eye, without just making sure. What about oral steroids? Oral steroids are, are okay if used judiciously, because no, knowing that they can get into the tear film. The only time I'll really use an oral steroid in a corneal ulcer is when it's really, really, really bad reflex uveitis. That's the only time that I'll use a corneal, or a pred, or like a pred, you know, what have you, any mm. corticosteroid. Orally. Orally. Orally, yeah. yeah. Good to know. All right, so how, tell us how the cornea reacts to disease or trauma, I guess. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty straightforward list, and it all really makes sense. Um, so you get edema because that epithelial layer is one of the things keeping water out. And so you're going to get a cloudy eye because that, that water is able to come in and cause that stroma to swell. You're going to get vascularization. It needs vessels to heal. It's an avascular structure. So with the, especially chronically, you're going to see those vessels coming in. Can a cornea heal without vessels? Heck yeah, it happens all the time because of epithelial sliding. But when things get hairy, it needs the vessels to come in and help. Um, So the vascularization is going to be one of the things. Fibrosis or scarring is going to be something you see because of that fibroblastic activity. Melanosis is another thing. Chronically, with all that vascularization, it will inherently carry some melanocytes to the corneal surface and those will deposit. Stromal infiltration of white blood cells. Um, an accumulation of substances on the cornea, most notably mineral, so like a calcium or lipid. I did want to note that this is like an inflammatory process. It's going to be typically unilateral and sometimes can cause by long-term steroid use. This is going to be a corneal degeneration. But I just wanted to note, because there's another disease process I'm going to talk about in a second, that people will frequently confuse corneal degeneration with corneal dystrophy. And then when you want to knock your head against a wall, you get corneal malacia or keratomalacia, I should say. Um, That's your melting ulcer. That's when you're on the phone with an ophthalmologist getting some help. Um, That's when you're sending it to an ophthalmologist. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Oh, no. Just quick. I have a quick question about the melanosis. Is is that what causes pigmentary keratitis? Yes. Is that the melanosis? Yep. Okay. Yep. One one thing, whenever you see anything in the cornea, I, this is something I always harp on. If, if you see like a crystally thing on the cornea, always check thyroid. Always, always, always check a thyroid. Interesting. Systemic hyperlipidemia can deposit on the cornea. You do see that in your hypothyroid patients. Mm. Whenever you see crystally things on the cornea, always be talking about checking a thyroid. Even without concurrent clinical signs, I have caught a handful of hypothyroid patients based on corneal presentation alone. And you would do a full thyroid panel, right? Not just a total T4? Um, a lot of times I'll run it in-house. I'll just, we'll check the total T4. We have a really, really good cost-effective thyroid panel in Michigan State. So if I have a low total T4 in my in-house labs, I just send out a full thyroid panel to MSU. So I get, I get everything. Yeah. Um, I always, free like, thyroid. it's funny. It's Michigan. It's, I totally forgot. Yeah. Is it, is it really the hypothyroid or is it the hyperlipidemia? It's the hyperlipidemia. Because there are some breeds that get hyperlipidemia without having hypothyroidism. Super good point. And I'm not, and if, I mean, I'm, I'm guarantee someone has studied this, but I'd be curious if there are those, like the Schnauzer, <laughs> um, if you're going to see an increased lipid deposit in Schnauzer corneas versus other. That'd be interesting. Hmm. All right. So something we don't talk about a lot, which I would love for you to kind of touch on, is inherited corneal diseases. What are some of those? They're traditionally, I mean, they're cool when you see them because you don't see them often. Like I'd probably say in general practice, I've probably seen four cases of an inherited corneal disease. So there's a microcornea, which is where you look, look at the eye and you're like, it's a normal eyeball, but the cornea is just way too small. 
So like the sclera like takes over the eye. It comes in. <gasps> yeah. And you look at and you're like basically like there's more clear on this side than on this side. Um, I've seen it most notably in a condition called Merle ocular dysgenesis, um, which is in like the, the, any dog with that Merle coloring. I've seen it in two Great Danes, but mm-hmm. had a microcornea. The dermides are really cool. You can think of it like a patch of hair growth on the corneal surface. Very easy to take care of. I did one during my, I think it was during the internship. We did a guinea pig. Maybe that was an externship. It was an externship where there was a guinea pig with a dermoid and we removed it. How do you um, remove it? You just scrape it? You just do a keratectomy. Some people will put a conjunctival graft over it, but most of the people just let it heal like a normal ulcer. By the way, I just looked up microcornea in a dog. That is trippy, man. Isn't That's it? scary. Yeah. So you'll know it when you see it. Persistent pupillary membranes. I think we might have talked about that previously, but that's just a remnant of the iris sticking to the endothelium. Superficial punctate keratitis. That's a dachshund thing. And I'm not going to go into that. I've only seen it one time. Going back to what I was harping on earlier, the other differential for those crystally things on the surface of the cornea is going to be corneal lipid dystrophy. So this is a non-inflammatory condition. Traditionally bilateral, I believe that it will show up earlier in the disease process. And I believe they're going to have a normal fasting lipid panel. Hmm. So that's just one thing. Basically, I, I think the unilateral versus bilateral concept is, is very helpful for me and just age of presentation. And then cordial endothelial dystrophy. So that's when you get basically a very edematous eye without a known cause. Pressures are normal, no ulcer. Endothelial disease is something we don't think about enough, but certainly happens. And that's when you reach for like your Miro 128, so your 5% sodium chloride. And I've seen some people put them on a topical NSAID. That's always something to keep in mind, though, because we don't. I, I feel like we don't think about endothelial disease enough. Yeah. One thing you didn't mention was, um, can you see calcium deposits in the cornea as well? You can, and I'm pretty sure. I was told one time the only real way to tell the difference between the two is going to be like histology. Calcium and lipid? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. At the end of the day... I mean, if you suspect dystrophy, it's likely going to be lipid. If you suspect degeneration, it can be both. But I believe it's more commonly lipid. If you can really, really, really get a good close-up look of the crystalline opacity, lipid looks like, imagine taking a fence and pushing it down and having all of the boards of the fence just cross over each other. It looks like a fallen down picket fence. Oh, pick if I was like a chain link fence. Oh yeah, <laughs> no pick it. Pick what it, kind of it. fence? <laughs> yeah. What? Okay. Yeah, that's all right. What it looks like, just like big things, just kind of crossing over each other. So like slats of wood, like yeah. all on top of each other. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's lipid. Okay. Interesting. And you'll see that with a slit lamp, or can you see that with a regular ophthalmoscope? It's hard to see with an opsco- ophthalmoscope. Okay. It's really hard. I can I can say I suspect it all the time. Never have I been confident enough to say this is lipid. I do miss my slit lamp, honestly, I miss it. Let's talk about the most common thing that us general practitioners are gonna see in the cornea, corneal ulcerations. So corneal ulcerations, what do they look like? Basically, you're gonna have hyperemic conjunctiva, so a red eye, the easiest way to think about it, blepharospasm. The number one question whenever someone says that my dog has an eye problem, are they squinting or are they not squinting? That, that is the first thing that will come out of my mouth because that's so, so, so important. Neovascularization, like I talked about, and that's going to be something you can see a little more chronically. Corneal edema, that can be rather acute. Meiosis, that's going to be from that reflex uveitis, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And in really bad reflex uveitis, you could see a little trace aqueous flare. And tearing too, right? You'll see tearing. Oh yeah, good, super good point. You're going to see a, a really, really, it's going to obvious one eye is tearing more than the other. They can be pawing at the eye, thank you, Marissa, um, <laughs> rubbing it on carpet, you name it. It's, it's just a pain. I mean, it's painful. It's painful. Yeah. Although a lot of things in the eye, like a lot of diseases look like that too, right? You might, you, you, you know, you have to suspect glaucoma too if you, if you see that. Totally. There's a really, really good algorithm. I think it's released through Cl- Clinician's Brief written by Ian Herring. It's basically, it walks you through the, the workup for a red eye. I've seen that. Very helpful. He's he's like one of the one of the guys in the ophthalmology world. So cool. Very well written algorithm. 
So it it seems obvious what causes a corneal ulcer, but I'm sure there's other things that we don't think of right off the bat. Totally. Most commonly, people can be like, oh, he got scratched in the eye. Sometimes, but hey, there's other things that happen. So tear film deficiencies. So I refer you to episode two of the Opto series. So you have qualitative or quantitative tear film deficiencies. Eyelid dysfunction. So a lag ophthalmus, in- incomplete closure of the eyelids and cranial nerve dysfunction, most notably cranial nerve 7 and 5, the trigeminal, uh, the ophthalmic branch and trigeminal. Um, you can see endogenous, so entropian, which I seem to, I've had a run of entropian and with all with corneal ulcers lately. Um, dystochiasis, I'd say clinically, I probably see more just epiphora with dystochiasis, so increased tearing. But if you have a little short hair rubbing on a cornea, it can certainly cause that. Thank you for using the word epiphora when I just use the word tearing. <laughs> this welcome. is the difference between a general practitioner and a specialist. I'm sorry. He's not a specialist. Sorry. Someone with Almost advanced specialist. training. Someone with advanced, advanced training. training in ophthalmology. Someone I would trust. Yes. There we go. Thank you. Ectopic cilia. So if you see a if you see an ulcer in a young dog at the dorsal 50% of the cornea, and if it's linear ectopic cilia. These are horrifically painful. I always feel pretty good when I find them because it's a fairly common misdiagnosis. And so when we would have, when I was on the ophthalmology service, when we would have a dog referred in for ectopic cilia, that was a big, like, they did a really good job Nice for this referral. Could a general practitioner take care of that? If, if they can't refer, I, I, I refuse to let a dog go through life with this. Yeah. Have I taken care of them on a general practice basis? Yes. I did it with a punch biopsy and a cryo pen Mm. and it worked. So basically you find the area. A lot of times the challenge is finding the actual hair. If it's non-pigmented, good luck, Mm. but finding that hair and removing it. Trichiasis, like a nasal trichiasis is another thing. And then eyelid tumors. I'd say most of the eyelid tumors I see, they don't really cause ulceration. They just cause irritation. Mm -hmm. And then you have exogenous causes. So trauma, foreign body, and then infectious. All right. Diagnosis. Diagnosis. So fluorescein dye, 100%. That's going to be your staple. Okay. And it will only be fluorescein positive if it has breached the basement membrane. That will lead me into a conversation that me and Andrew were just having about two different stains. Yes, I prefer lysamine green. I don't know about you, Marissa. <laughs> okay, Do you wait. Prefer, so, uh, rose bengal or lysamine green? All right. <laughs> <laughs> Do we not call it fluorescein stain? I just want to go back to you calling it the fluorescein dye test. I don't commit to either. It's a stain. But when, when I when I type in my medical records, I call it the fluorescein dye test, and I abbreviate it FDT but it is technically a fluorescein stain. If that's only going to tell you if it's breached the basement membrane, because it will go with that hydrophobic stroma, sorry, hydrophilic stroma. The other two stains that we look at are the rose bangle stain and the lysamine green stain. Those are both going to basically stain dead and devitalized epithelium. So erosion, it's going to pick up erosions. You can sometimes find Tear film deficiencies, that's one of the things that they will use. You'll see some devitalization of the epithelium. Um, But those are two other stains you can do. Uh, If you have them, to this day, I've never been to a general practice that has those. Nope, Um, never And there's really no, there's no reason, I I guess. I don't think it's a practical thing to keep. Um, The Schirmer tear test, if you have a considerable difference between Schirmer tear test values, right eye to left eye, I'd be looking at that right eye. Why is it tearing so much? Always looking at corneal and palpebral reflex because we want to make sure there's not a neurogenic cause. Just looking at anatomy, and I think that's something that, you know, I get so excited. This is a corneal ulcer, and I won't even think to look at the lid margin. Are there any, I won't think to look at the, look for an ectopic cilia. Just looking at the actual lid and conjunctival anatomy to make sure there's no aberration that will cause that scratch. Another thing that, it's always forgotten. And again, you get excited, especially with a melting ulcer. You're probably stressed. You forget about culture, 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 when you suspect infection. So sometimes I see such severe blepharospasm that it almost appears like entropion. Mm-hmm. So a spastic entropion. Yeah. 
And so how do you know that it's not real and troken that you have to deal with? Yeah, I, what I usually do is I look at the dog normally, then I'll put a drop of proparacaine in the eye, numb up the eye, so any corneal pain that the dog has should technically go away. And then I'll look at the anatomy when the dog is comfortable. If I still see rolling when the dog is not painful from its cornea, I can call it a true entropian. Great answer. Thank you. It's a nice trick for me to, if, I, if I'm ever wondering, is this, is this squinting coming from corneal issues or pain or something else? Proparacaine. Numb it up. See what happens. Are there any contraindications to using proparacaine on an eye with an ulcer? On a one-off? No. Okay. It is, I, mean, I believe it is epithelial toxic because owners are always like, well, can I have that drop? She's not squinting yeah. anymore. <laughs> it's magical. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Can't have it. All right. So let's talk about simple versus complicated ulcers. So the best, so we, we have two types of ulcers. Just like Marissa said, simple and complicated. How do you determine which, which, it, which one it is? Depth of ulcer and duration of ulcer. So a simple ulcer is going to be acute and superficial. It should heal within seven days without progression into the stroma. And at that point, clinically, that's all she wrote. A complicated ulcer is going to be around longer for seven days, can have stromal involvement, is going to be deep and or chronic. So it's not an all or nothing. This is something I, I, I think about this all the time and I harp on this when I talk to people about this. If you have an ulcer that does not heal in seven days, one of three things is happening. Either there's an underlying undi undiagnosed cause that you haven't treated and is still present, the ulcer has become infected, or it's an indolent ulcer. So uh, something I, a sentence I really like is, if an ulcer doesn't heal in seven days, change your diagnosis, don't change your antibiotic. Mm. There's no reason a, a, a non-infected eye is going to heal better with ofloxacin as opposed to neopolybac. That's a really good if point. If it's not infected. I didn't even think about that. There are two antibiotics that are considered epithelial toxic. Um, ciprofloxacin and gentamicin. I think that they they basically had the longest, basically from ulcer to heal or complete resolution was the longest with those two antibiotics. So I do shy away from those, but they did heal eventually anyway. All right. So don't just keep switching your antibiotics, everyone. All yeah, right. I mean, and it's tempting to. It it's is. Really I mean, eas easily tempted to. But if it's infected anyway, like you would need to do a culture. So you'd need to see them for a recheck. You'd need to do a yep. culture. And then you would wait for the results of the culture. Totally. Yeah. Just quick question. You would see other signs, you'd see other ocular manifestations, right? Not just indolent ulcer, right? You'd, you'd see in signs of infection. So yeah, you're, I mean, you're going to see a, a white appearance to the cornea. It's going to look just, I'll use the word mushy just because I think it's the best way. It just looks soft. Like you, you can like, it's it just, it's gross. Like a melting ulcer. Okay. They, they're, 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 they're gross. <laughs> like a really, really bad melt. It's, it's not good. And remind us how we culture these if we want to. In a perfect world. You would do it before any proparacaine or before any drop, any, before any fluorescein stain. So if you see that presentation of the melting ulcer, grab your culture before you stain it. Honestly, at that point, a stain is it's a required diagnostic, but it's in a certain mindset. It's almost redundant in a way because you already know this is a horrifically ulcerated eye. There's no other reason an eye is going to look like that. So always grab your culture if you can before. Also, I do some cytologies on eyes too, and I always try to grab my cytologies before proparacaine or anything like that. But other than that, it's just this, just like you would collect a culture from any other part of the body. Got it. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Treatment. As with 90% of the things in veterinary medicine, correct the underlying cause if there is one. If it's an entropion, you might resolve the ulcer but it needs surgery. It, you know, you name it. If there's an ectopic cilia, you probably won't resolve the ulcer in that scenario. But um, if the underlying cause is still there, either it's not going to heal or it's going to pop right back after you discontinue treatment. So one mainstay is going to be antibiotics. We're not treating with antibiotics in a simple ulcer because it's infected. We're preventing infection. 
that stroma is predisposed. So for dogs, I really like to start with a Neapoly back. And for cats, I like teramycin. If you have a horrific ulcer that you're like, this eye is going to pop open, like a desmetaseal or like a really deep stromal ulcer, avoid ointments. That can cause a really nasty granulomatous uveitis. So always go with solutions for those. So for the infected ulcers, you can have seen rapid progression, a poor response to your normal therapy, and your cytology and culture results suggest otherwise. What are, you gonna, what are your other options? I think ofloxacin is a great eye drop, and I use it frequently. It's going to have the same coverage as teramycin. But then you can do compounded ophthalmics. That's a whole other kit and caboodle. I think whenever I compound any eye drops, I'll compound cefazolin. Whenever you do multiple antibiotics, always make sure you're making that choice based on coverage as opposed to, I'm going to add on another antibiotic. Make sure that you're actually expanding your actual antibiotic coverage versus just having two for no reason. Because if they have the exact same coverage, there's no reason to have that. So just making sure that you're getting that, you know, hitting as much as you possibly can. The next thing is going to be mydriatic therapy. So atropine. Basically, you get that ulcer, you're going to get a stimulation of that corneal nerve through the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal. That's going to go back to the anterior uvea and cause uveitis, which we know is painful due to spasming of that ciliary muscle. So the atropine will paralyze that muscle. So you'll get a very mydriatic pupil, a big pupil. Some people use caution in KCS patients because it's a parasympatholytic and you're going to technically decrease tear production. But I'll be perfectly honest, in the two scenarios, I'd rather the dog be comfortable and probably be on atropine for a short period of time as opposed to me being like, well, he has KCS, I'm going to let him squint. It'll be fine thereafter after you discontinue. And then analgesics, I like oral NSAIDs. I don't like to use topical NSAIDs because they they will inhibit vascular ingrowth. And then another thing is prevention of self-trauma. So all dogs with, a, with an ulcer should go home with an e-collar. I really like it, really like it when a hospital has contact lenses. I love it. I love putting them in. I lo- they, they work so well, um, especially for entropian dogs. But if you can get an ulcer or a, a bandaged contact lens on an on a ulcer, that's going to increase healing because you're not going to get that abrasion from the eyelids. Basically, start your therapy, recheck seven days. If it's not healed, it's complicated. Just quickly back to the contact lenses. Are those easy to order? Is it something Fairly that, easy. Uh, any? Yeah? Okay. Yeah, they're easy. I'd probably get a size like 15, 16. I think you'll cover most of your, most of your patients that way. And I had, I had an owner cry one time because her dog had horrific entropion. And she's like, I've never seen my dog's eyes ever since I've had it. Aww. I popped two contact lenses in. And so now the I, it's not being abraded and the dog look and she just, she lost it. <laughs> it was a, a super high point. I, was, I felt really good. Um, so contact lenses are great. It's like giving them like Proparacaine, but it's not Proparacaine. Same thing. Yeah. Here's a Proparacaine you can take home. Exactly. If they ask for the Proparacaine drops, you say, well, we have something better. There you go. You're, and yeah, and chihuahuas were the same size as Great Danes. Yeah, I think a, a Great Dane might be a little bit bigger. But I, I think if you order 15s and 16s, I think you'll get most, even a cat. I think you'll, a 15 would fit on a cat. You've used well, them in cats too? the distributor that I use doesn't have them. So I wonder if there's, an, like, do you get them from a special place? Honestly, I'm not sure where they ordered them, but I requested them and they arrived. Um, <laughs> I personally wear contact lenses, but... Yeah, I don't know where you get blank ones, but I'm going to figure this out. Yeah, they're great. Um, so that'd be your sim- simple. Um, so for deeper corneal ulcers, so deep stromal ulcers at desmetaceles, always remember your cytology and culture. Um, just for as a review, a desmetaceal is going to be that deep all the way down to desmase membrane. No stain uptake centrally because desmase, does, desmase doesn't pick up stain. That's when you have this conversation of rupture, when it ruptures, the iris can pop forward and be prolapsed or synechiated. This dog needs a conjunctival graft. So treatment is somewhat similar to simple corneal ulcers, just with a few different tweaks. Um, you're going to increase your antibiotic administration. You can go up to Q1. Depending on how worried I am, I might go to like a Q3 or Q4. I don't think I've ever done Q1, even in my worst ulcer, but you can. So your antibiotic, your mydriatic, prevention of self-trauma, 
or I'll NSAID. When you're worried about malacia, that's when you can do your analogous serum. Now you can use serum from any dog. It doesn't have to be from that specific dog. Hmm. So sometimes if I have an owner that's okay with it, I'll just draw a few vials of blood and just make a few eyedroppers of serum. And so I have that to grab. Is that something you got to keep in the fridge? Freezer. Free- that's right. Because I was like, wait, how do you keep that from getting infected? But yeah, freezer. That's right. Freeze them. And yeah. when you do serum, my rule is keep in the refrigerator, discard after 72 hours, because you, sh- you should be rechecking that eye in 72 hours anyway. Yeah, that's a good uh, point. And then uh, this wasn't in the text that I was reading today, but doxycycline is has anti-collagenase and anti-protease properties. Um, so I'll do that frequently with my melts. If it's over 50% depth, that's when you talk about the conjunctival graft, refer that. That's going to be one of the few things that the ophthalmologist is probably going to come in off hours for. Then another type of complicated ulcer is going to be your indolent. So this is a failed union of the epithelial membrane to the anterior layer of the stroma. Dogs over about six years old, and I think boxers, it can happen like any time in life because it's also called the boxer ulcer chronic, superficial, non-infected. Sometimes these dogs aren't even that painful. Inherently, the main finding is you you diagnose a complicated ulcer because it's still there seven days out. And you're going to see a lip of epithelium or kind of like a halo-like effect with your stain because it leaks under those edges. You can find pictures of it super, super easily. I've seen these a lot in uh, English bulldogs. Oh, 100%. Like the, the English Bulldogs, Boxers, Goldens. I see them a lot in Goldens, Pit Bulls. Yeah, a lot of them. So f- what I do here is I debride. I will treat as I had been treating, recheck in seven days. And in the meantime, I have them get out an appointment with the ophthalmologist because more than likely they're going to need a diamond burr, debridement, or a good keratotomy. And remember, don't do that in cats. Would you diamond burr debride things in general practice if you had one of those? I have. I had, a, but the, my old practices did buy me one and it was going really well. And then I had like a string of three that didn't heal for me for whatever reason. I don't know if it was a bad burr and I'd it used the same technique that I'd used previously. So I stopped doing them at that point mm. um, just because I was like, strike three, you're done. Yeah. They, they'd worked beautifully for me before. Um, and I'm not, I, it was like a new unit and it was a new burr. Um, I'm not sure if people were cleaning them. I'm not sure what happened, but um, I did do it for a while. And it was, it, honestly, it was a really great resource because it's so hard to get into an ophthalmologist. Yeah. Wow. I've, I've done grids before and they work too. Yeah. I, I've I mean, done grids. Nothing wrong with a grid. Yeah. And remind us why the grid works. So that's going to create basically a scaffolding for that, that epithelial layer to hang on to. Awesome. You'll grab onto that stroma. All right. So finishing this up, obviously there's lots of other corneal diseases, but let's just touch on them pretty quickly. All right. So you can see epithelial inclusion cysts. That's when epithelium gets caught in the stroma and forms a cyst. Stromal abscesses. I'll see that with penetrating injuries where bacteria gets implanted into the stroma. Or into the stroma. That's going to be more of a horse thing. Corneal lacerations, we see that like cat claw injuries. It's going to, treatment depends on depth. Corneal foreign bodies, you see basically there's an ulcer, but what's that little brown thing? Always, always, always irrigate. Um, I'll put basically three mLs of saline with a catheter and just irrigate the eye, recheck, and it's the best way to get a corneal foreign body. We talked about the pigmentary Keratitis, that's going to be your chronic, expo- kind of a consequence of your chronic exposure, can be caused from ciliary disorders or to your film dysfunction. Um, then the last thing I think is something, interestingly enough, a lot, I, I think this was caught more than I anticipated once I got into general practice. People really do know about PANIS, and I, I love it because it, it's, it's a very treatable disease. So PANIS, or chronic immune-mediated superficial keratoconjunctivitis. German shepherds and greyhounds, people forget about the greyhound, um, you're going to get that lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate leading to melanocytes, histiocytes, yada, 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 and then edema and neovascularization. The epithelium is intact with this, but there's just mounds of fibrous granulation tissue, which can retain fluorescein stain. That's something to always note. Even I get nervous putting a steroid on these, mm. but I trust my diagnosis. It's a German shepherd. 
with, again, they all start, they usually will start at the temporal limbus, moving axially or centrally. If I strongly suspect, I trust my diagnosis and I'll use that topical. I'll usually use like a 0.1% dexamethasone every six to 12 hours. You can always also use a predacetate or a neopolydex. One thing is it is associated with high, basically UV exposure. So if you've seen doggles or rec specs, um, I've recommended those in all of my penis cases. Do dogs keep those on? Because like, I can't imagine Lois ever keeping anything Some on. do, <laughs> some don't. <laughs> She's some eat do. it. I feel like the rec specs are more, are better tolerated than the doggles. Because they're like big. It's almost like a ski mask oh, right. versus yeah. like goggles for swimming. Yeah. Um, if you're ever unsure, do a cytology. You'll see lymphocytes and plasmacytes. Hmm. You know, this isn't going to be cured. Always warn them this is going to be lifelong. We'll be able to decrease frequency of administration of medications, but not completely eliminated. I, my goal is to usually get them on a strict regimen of cyclosporin or tacrolimus. That's yeah. my goal. And usually I can make it. Um, but yeah, tr- like I said, treatment is going to be a 0.1% dexamethasone or a 1% pradacetate every 6 to 12 and then you can always move to like an Optimune every 12 hours, or I, a lot of times I'll put them on Tacrolimus, a so 0.03% every 12 to 24. And what kind of improvement should you see with that? You should see considerable regression of all that tissue, but give it a month, at least a month for the owner to actually have an appreciable, like, yes, things are getting better. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you. Wow, Casey. That was, that Cor- was a whirlwind. Corneas with Casey. Or Cornea's Cone Casey, if we're going to be a fun one to name. (laughs) I like that. I like that. I'm putting that up. (laughs) Cornea's Cone Casey. All right. Well, thank you again, Casey. I hope we can have you on for one last ophthalmic roundup. Or what I like like to call the grab bag, just because that's funny. The grab bag. (laughs) (laughs) Wait, I'm going to ask Casey this question real quick. I know he has to go. But, Casey, when you were in vet school, in your anatomy mm-hmm. lab, did you, during your testing, have something called bone in a bag where you had to put your hand in a bag without looking and there's a bone in there and you had to identify it based purely on touch? Unless I'm really, really like getting that out of my brain, no, we did not do that. Well, at Penn, we like to feel yeah. around in a bag. <laughs> I was going to say, is this a Penn we moment? I guess I I've think been I asked. Have blocked, I, I have blocked out anatomy class. I loved anatomy. anatomy. It was like my favorite. Anyway. Yeah. I was a tutor all through all through vet school. It was an easy way to make money, and I liked anatomy. Yeah. That's it was cool at the time, but then, you know, the tests were really hard. Mm-hmm. Large animal anatomy was a bummer. Oof. Oof, yeah. All right. Well, thank you again, Casey. This has been awesome. Thank and you, uh, we'll see you in a couple weeks. See you soon. We hope you enjoyed this episode on the Indie Vets Happy Hour. Thank you for listening. Tell your friends. And if you like us, leave us a five-star review. And make sure to subscribe so you can be alerted whenever we have a new episode. If you have questions, comments, or suggestions for future episodes, you can email us at clinical at IndieVets.com. Also, to learn more about us and how we're making vet med better, head to IndieVets.com. That's I-N-D-E-V-E-T-S dot com. While you're there, be sure to head to our blog for the latest stories and tips from our doctors. And lastly, if you're interested in joining our amazing IndieVets team, please email Dr. Andrew Heller at andrew at indievets.com. See you next time. Cheers. Cheers. I'm a veterinarian, sure, but I'm way more than that. I am also a tango dancer, a struggling but determined pie maker, and a mom. With IndieVets, I get to choose when and where I work. I create my own schedule and choose shifts at nearby animal hospitals that are right for me. Having that flexibility is exactly what I need to have plenty of time for all those other things that I am. Because I'm more than just a vet. Visit IndieVets.com to learn more and apply.